It's the Maxwell Institute podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. When you think about your religious beliefs, your theology, how much consideration have you given to your race? How has the color of your skin affected your understanding of God, Jesus Christ, or your religious community? Maybe you've never thought much about it. If you're a black Latter-day Saint in America, you virtually can't escape these kinds of questions. Many black American Latter-day Saints know that questions about the color of their skin and their faith are deeply intertwined and have a long history. Add the component of gender and the questions only multiply. Janan Graham Russell visited the Neil A. Maxwell Institute here at Brigham Young University this summer to talk about a type of theology called womanist theology, thinking about God from the perspective of black women. Janan is a writer and a graduate of the Howard University School of Divinity in Washington, D.C. Her research focuses on womanist theology in Mormonism and identity formation in racial communities. Her writing has been featured in two books. Mormon Feminism, Essential Writings, and A Book of Mormons, as well as in The Atlantic. Janan's continuing her research now at Harvard University, and in this episode, she discusses race, identity, and theology. Questions and comments about this and other episodes of the Maxwell Institute podcast can be sent to mipodcast at byu.edu, and please take a moment to rate and review the show in iTunes. Janan Graham-Russell, welcome to the Maxwell Institute. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Let's start off by talking a little bit about identity. There's an author named Gabriel Garcia Marquez who wrote a book called Love in the Time of Cholera. And there's a quote from that that I wanted to ask you about. It says, human beings are not born once and for all on the day their mothers gave birth to them. Life obliges them over and over again to give birth to themselves. Does that quote resonate with you at all? It really does. Uh, growing up, I always looked at adulthood as this final destination that I'll get to the end point. But as I've been learning and exploring it, it's more of a process than a destination. Um, it reminds me of this poem by Jamaica Kincaid called Blackness, if I could read that. Yeah, please, please do. So she says, how soft is the blackness as it falls? It falls in silence, and yet it is deafening. For no other sound except the blackness falling can be heard. The blackness falls like soot from a lamp with an untrimmed wick. The blackness is visible, and yet it is invisible, for I see that I cannot see it. The blackness fills up a small room, a large field, an island, my own being. The blackness cannot bring me joy, but often I am made glad in it. The blackness cannot be separated from me, but often I can stand outside of it. The blackness is not the air, though I breathe it. The blackness is not the earth, though I walk on it. The blackness is not water or food, though I drink and eat it. The blackness is not my blood, though it flows through my veins. The blackness enters my many tiered spaces and soon the significant word and event recede and eventually vanish. In this way, I am annihilated and my form becomes formless and I'm absorbed into a vastness of free-flowing matter. In the blackness, then, I have been erased. I can no longer say my own name. I can no longer point to myself and say I. In the blackness, my voice is silent. First, then, I have been my individual self, carefully banishing randomness from my existence. Then I am swallowed up in the blackness so that I am one with it. That's a beautiful poem, and you're a woman, you're an African-American, you're a Latter-day Saint. You have a lot of different identities. You're a student, a daughter, a friend. This poem focuses particularly on blackness. Talk about that as a lens through which you view your identity. Absolutely. So when I think of blackness, I think about black culture, I think about black people, and it's, it's important to look at the different cultures rather than just a black culture, um, especially as an African-American. There's the tendency to think, well, there's only there's a singular way to look at blackness. But then when we're talking about blackness. We have to recognize people in Jamaica, in Ghana, in uh, Australia. Um, and when I'm looking at this poem and thinking about blackness, it's it's hard to put one. There's no one term for blackness. And that's when I read this poem from from Jamaica Kincaid and she's talking about what it means to be black and she's she's saying that there, it's indescribable but it's it's only it's a feeling and I'm, I'm not saying a feeling like 
Rachel Dolezal kind of feeling and like tr quote unquote transracial, uh, but it's it's an experience and it's a feeling. And I think she conveys that in her poem very well. Yeah, it's almost an unfair question because the poem itself does the work and I'm asking you to sort of unpack what perhaps only her poetry can really communicate. I'm, I'm asking you <laughs> to unpack something that maybe has to be expressed through the kind of language that she uses. Mm -hmm. Lots of imagery and lots of metaphors. So all these different identities that you have um, as an African-American Latter-day Saint, student, daughter, friend, uh, you know, you, you uh, a mother. Um, how did you come to be to add Latter-day Saint as an identity? Growing up, I was raised in the Methodist Church. Uh, my parents, or my my mother rather, is a um, she practices. Uh, she's a non-denominational Christian, but I would attend Methodist services. My was dad it AME or specifically or a different. It was a different different sect. Um, but my dad actually he's he practices Islam. So um, my way to Mormonism was kind of a curvy up and down road. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't really into church when I was growing up. Um, it just, it didn't feel right to me. There was just something that just wasn't speaking to me. And I, I grew up with a lot of the very, like the fire and brimstone, God, eternal, uh, I can say damnation. Yeah. Okay. Eternal damnation. Um, eternal damnation. And so I, it just, it never felt right to me. And so I, I subtly shifted away from the church, but, um, I think it was around my undergrad, like my senior year, I felt like something was missing. And that led me to want to explore how people looked at faith. Um, that was kind of the beginning of my academic pursuits as well, but it was, was more- Was this also at Howard or was it someplace else at this point? So this was at Purdue. Okay, so I, so I went to Purdue. my undergrad at Purdue University in in, Laf in West Lafayette, Indiana. Hmm. So I, I looked at Judaism. I looked at Islam because that's, that's something I was. I still had my roots in. Um, I I came across Mormonism. I I knew a lot of Mormons in my high school years, but I was like, oh, I'm not gonna. They, you know, they were super nice. I didn't really talk to them very very often when I was younger. Um, but I did some research on Mormonism, and I came across two sister mission. Or they they found me actually when I was doing some work at uh, University of Colorado. Older. and we just started talking about faith and what we believed and I, I really loved what I what I heard especially um, about the different kingdoms I thought that was really important to me especially because there are people who don't have the opportunity to be able to learn about Christ and learn about God and so how can we how can how can they be sentenced to eternal damnation if they don't know so sort of opening up that afterlife picture yeah, it's that opening was appealed up. to you. It was, yeah. yeah, that was a, a huge appeal. Um, also, the work with families. Um, I'm pretty close with my family. Something that we I loved to do when I was growing up was every, so like Thanksgiving, Christmas, we would come together and we would just look at family pictures and just talk about our history. And so that aspect of family history really resonated with me and finding your ancestors and establishing and maintaining those connections was really important and so that's what really led me to the lds church so as you went through you eventually were baptized you became a member of the lds church at what point in that journey did you were you introduced to some of the complexities and i'm thinking about for example the lds church's relationship to race throughout its history including uh, a ban on african men from holding the priesthood and women from being endowed in the temple and that sort of thing at what point in your journey were you introduced to some of the complexities which probably contrasted with some of these other interesting ideas that appealed to you. Yes. Um, so I was I was aware of the priesthood restrictions, priesthood and temple restrictions, rather, before I joined. Um, but I wasn't aware how complex they were until I was baptized and I was going to the temple. And I looked around the temple and all I saw were white faces. And to me, it was we're in this holy place and I don't see anyone who looks like me. Um, and so that's really what began that journey was not seeing any church leaders that look like me or any of the or black or brown faces um, and going to the temple. That was a really powerful experience. Um, story that I often talk about is going to the temple for the first time and seeing this portrait of Jesus 
in heaven. I'm, I wish I knew the name of the port. Do you know the name of the, I, it's so it's like, it's Jesus with angels and they're all in heaven and they're just with their trumpets and there's this bright light. He's probably coming down. Is he descending? Cause there's one where there's like a desert landscape. So there's angels on both sides and he's sort of standing, sort of descending. I think he was descending. I, think I mean, it's like a Harry Anderson portrait or something. I mean, it's a beautiful portrait yeah. either way. It's, um, but I saw the angels and he was all, sur he was surrounded by white faces yeah. and white people. Yeah, they were all, yeah. They were all, yes. And they yeah. were all white. And it, it, for me, it was, what does that mean for the eternities? Do people, do my fellow brothers and sisters see me? Is this how they see me in the afterlife? And where does that leave me in the present? If this is what you think what the eternal ex perspective is, then what does it mean for the temporal experience? So did, have those sort of questions then gone on to inform the kind of work that you've ended up doing as you've pursued higher education? Yes. Um, so that's that's really what started me on this path was not seeing seeing that representation, not only in artwork, but also the theology. Um, if we think about theology of darkness and, and black skin, it's related to the curse of Cain. Um, and there's there's never really been any kind of theology to undo that. That's that's something that I really strive for is when you're thinking, when you look, when you see a theology that is oppressive, that there needs to be a theology to undo it. And so far there is never, there there isn't any theology to really undo what was done with the policy and its subsequent theology. And so that's really what is the driving factor between the work that I do with black liberation theology and womanist theology within Mormonism. Let's talk about theology specifically. There's this interesting quote from a Catholic theologian, Karl Barth, and he described theology as something that the Christian church does. The Christian church is subjecting herself to a self test through theology. What do you think of that description? I mean, it takes me back to my divinity school days of at its basic point that theology is faith seeking understanding. And so when we're talking about theology, it's understanding ourselves, it's understanding each other. Um, I don't think we talk enough about the interconnectedness between theology and culture. And so if we look at what's going on culturally, we can go back, just go back to our theology and what, who do we say that God is? Because that really informs what we do socially, politically. Um, I've used this metaphor of pressure points. It's this idea that I, I feel like theology sometimes emerges as the result of some kind of itch that we humans need to scratch. And so, for example, thinking about the priesthood restrictions, um, the policy was that, you know, members of, of black African descent weren't to hold the priesthood or, or receive endowments and so forth. And, and it feels like that is something that demands an answer. And so there's this pressure point that then results in some kind of theology. Uh, and, and for the fact that the LDS Church has lifted that restriction now, perhaps for a lot of members, they feel like they don't sense a pressure point anymore. Whereas in your experience, there is a pressure point still there because some of those ideas that, that came up to explain that theory, maybe some of them are still around, they're still hovering around and, and nothing's really came in to, to replace those. You know, absolutely. LDS Church culture tends to be very white and Americentric. And so when you're talking about multiple theologies, whether it is um, um, Chicano uh, theology, if you're looking at black liberation theology, you're looking at any sort of theology that's not necessarily white and European, um, it, it has a lot of trouble being absorbed into LDS culture and faith. And so I think that's, that's, that's something that we, we often struggle with is that the potential for liberation theology working with Mormonism is there. Um, Joseph Smith talks about, uh, you could say that he talks about liberation theology in DNC 121, but it's just, it's, I feel like it's just right at the cusp, but there's just that fear of what that means. If individuals were to say, you know what, this was kind of racist and this theology was kind of racist. What does this mean for our prophets? What does this mean about our theology? What does this mean about our scriptures? Yeah, so these other pressure points start getting poked, you know, uh, for example, like, yeah, the role of a prophet or or that sort of thing. So this this idea that theology is an ongoing exchange, it, it happens whether we consciously do it or not, and it's very tied to individual perspectives. So as you mentioned, um, the church is very white and sort of Americentric, and so a lot of the common ideas or theologies or the, even the questions that people ask – 
are going to be filtered through that lens. And so we're missing out on a wider spectrum, a br- I should say a wider, I should say a broader <laughs> spectrum, right, of, of perspectives, of theological perspectives that, that could benefit the entire church. So some people might push back, and, and I'm interested to hear your response to this, and say, well, theology should just be for everybody. Why do you have to have these different kinds of theology? You mentioned Chicano and, and this sort of thing. Why not just have theology that covers everyone? And how would you respond to that? Right, all all, all uh, theology matters, right? Yeah, all theology <laughs> matters. Yes. yes. Hashtag hashtag that <laughs> on uh, on uh, Twitter. Um, I mean, theology really speaks to where we are. Not only our identities, our collective identities, um, and so if you're having this singular narrative that you you often see within the LDS narrative, that you're not really gaining these outside perspectives and so to be we, we talk about mormonism it's this community and we're and we're thinking if we think about salvation that it's a community effort and so if we're not attuned to what's going on on the other side of the mountain or the other side of the river then what is salvation truly what is it what is getting to heaven what is getting to the celestial kingdom if you're not helping your brother or sister get there so I think it's important then the work you're doing to sort of introduce people to these different approaches to theology. And let's drill down into some of these. So we'll start with kind of the broad umbrella of liberation theology. I'm thinking of Jacqueline Grant, who's a scholar who she talks about black theology, but she situates it within this broader context of liberation theology. How would you describe liberation theology to someone who hadn't heard of it before? So I would say that liberation theology is focused on the justice of God, Um, not necessarily the fire and brimstone aspect of of um, some Christian beliefs, um, but it's more centered on, like I said, justice, um, ethical behavior. Um, One question that that comes to mind when thinking about liberation theology is that what is what is it that God asks of us? within the text, whether we're looking at the Book of Mormon, we're looking at the Holy Bible, and what messages is Christ really telling us about the marginalized, those who are who are struggling. And so when I look at liberation theology, it's how do we make sure those at the margins achieve work towards salvation? And not just in the next life, but looking at in this life. We often talk about salvation as when you when you transition and you go go to one of the kingdoms or whatever your your um belief is exactly um sort of afterlife post yeah afterlife yeah yeah, post-mortal life yes that's that's a great way of that's that's a way to say it um that salvation can happen in the here and now and so that's something that liberation theology really focuses on especially black liberation theology is that how do we talk about salvation and hope in this life and talking about justice and that's a big, it's a, like I said, I, I keep saying justice, but it's a very, it's a key theme within liberation theology is that. And I like that you that. pointed out the idea that it's not justice in the sense of like this judge with a gavel sort of thing. It has more to do with equality. Um, it has more to do with this preferential option for the poor. Like uh, basically it'll focus on key biblical texts, mm-hmm. usually from the New Testament and many from the Old Testament that talk about God wanting his creation to be fruitful and equal and and to not have these inequalities basically and yes. and, and christ calling people and commanding people to to seek out the poor uh, one of the things he talks about is you know when i was in prison you visited me when i was sick you came and that sort of thing was was really what he focused on so th- those are the kind of texts that liberation theologians will sort of latch onto in contrast with classical theology which didn't seem quite as concerned with some of those questions is that fair to say yeah i would say so um there's a book called god's long summer and it talks about um there's a preacher his name was douglas hutchins i don't know if you're familiar with him he was uh uh, down in the south in the 1950s and 60s and he was more of a traditional theologian where justice was not something you spoke about there was always an order We, we talk about mlk's um he talks about um, the the white liberal is no the white sorry the white moderate is more committed to order than justice, mm-hmm. and so that's a similar going back to that the book God's Long Summer this this particular preacher was very focused on order, and when you're looking at liberation theology, 
it's not necessarily looking at order because if we looked at order, we think about, you can think about Brigham Young um, saying that eventually blacks will, black people will get the priesthood after everyone else has received the priesthood. Mm -hmm. But yeah, justice- There's an order to that, yeah. There's an order to it, but justice is no, everyone is one of God's children and that everyone, the priesthood will be available to everyone. That's a good a good way to show how sort of a liberation theology critique could be applied to sort of what Brigham Young uh, did in terms of policy. Let's talk about black theology then. So this is kind of under the umbrella of liberation theology. James Cone is one of the leading black theologians, and he's written about black theology. He said the task of black theology is to analyze the nature of the gospel of Jesus Christ in the light of oppressed black people so that they'll see the gospel as inseparable from their humiliated condition, bestowing on them the necessary power to break the chains of oppression. Expand a little bit on James Cone and that sort of approach of black theology. Oh yes, James Cone, that's, he is one of my favorites. He's one of my problematic favorites, favorites actually. Um, so, Theologians tend the, to do that yeah. to each other, yeah. I mean, we're not perfect, what are you talking about? <laughs> um, so James Cone, in the 1960s, he, he works a lot with Union Theological Seminary, and the approach to black theology was, who is Christ to the black man? For some time, the theology that was coming out of, I mean, even if you rewind back to um, Richard Allen in the AME Church, those are kind of the beginnings of black theology, but James Cone was really the one who put pen to paper and created the theory behind black theology. So essentially, black theology looks at the life of Christ as if he were a black man um, and through the lens of blackness and black people and essentially freeing Christ from this white European theological base that he's always he up until that point or into the into the, the century or so um, leading to the creation of the AME and uh, Richard Allen, freeing him from that. I say prison, but that description of Christ, this long hair, blue eyed white man, someone who looks like your oppressor, what does he have to say to someone who is being oppressed? Yeah, black people are coming from this context of a, a history of slavery, a history of oppression, and still economic inequalities and, and all sorts of things that different black communities are sort of dealing with. And then they have this picture of white, blue eyed Jesus, which mm -hmm. is not only historically inaccurate, but also looks like the face of the type of people that would have owned your, your ancestors. Right. It's the people who are, you know, burning crosses on your lawn mm -hmm. and not allowing you to have jobs. And so creating a dialogue around how can we build a faith and build a spirituality that speaks to us in our condition. And not necessarily, it's not just an oppressed state. That's something I want to make clear is oftentimes, and that's, that's why he's my problematic fave, because we often look at black people, black bodies, and only in terms of oppression, but it's also good to look at the achievements, to also look at not only what black people have done to survive, but also to thrive. Mm -hmm. And that's an aspect of black theology that we don't get to speak about very often. That's really interesting that I haven't read enough of the literature to see that, but you know, with theology, you're always going to find people that, that find a new avenue or find a new question or find something to, to say, but wait a minute. That's very interesting, this idea that you'd like to see it broaden and focus more, not just on the oppression, which is real and which is ongoing and which has to be engaged, but also the flip side of that coin. Yeah, absolutely. Because um, Cohn deals a lot with theodicy, um, but if you look at the womanist writers, womanist theologians, like you mentioned, Jacqueline Grant um, speaks a lot about Christology. Um, the problem of evil. What do you do? Yes. yes like, why is there yes. evil? How is God related to that? Why is there suffering? So on and so forth. So most of his focus is sort of on that question. On theodicy, and that's yes. a big question for people who, you know, you look at, especially throughout history, the slave trade, you look at some of these terrible things that have happened. Where would God be in all that? That's a pressing question, right? So so that's Cone. And then who's this other figure that's sort of looking at Christology? Uh, so Jacqueline Grant, this as is we Jacqueline. mentioned before. Okay, so that's yeah. Jacqueline Grant. Um, so she comes with the school. Uh, so she is... Uh, the school of black women who came up after James Cone. Um, they uh, also went to Union Theological Seminary and they're sitting in class and it's like, this black theology is great, but it's not really speaking to me as a woman. And so you have, like I said, Jacqueline Grant, Emily Towns, Dolores S. Williams, and there's just so many, uh, Renita Williams, I'm just name dropping everybody, you know, 
and then drop the mic. Um, <laughs> Janon Graham Russell will be joining the ranks. Soon. Yeah, just slip under there, right? <laughs> um, and so you have this, this school of womanist theologians who adapted uh, Alice Walker's original term womanism to, to speak to black women's experiences. One of the things Jacqueline Grant asks uh, in a piece that you sent me before the interview is, where are the black women in black theology? And you just named a, a number of them. So what happened there? What, tell, talk a little bit more about the situation for black women who are interested in theology and how that's taken shape and how that's changed what black theology is. Yeah, so womanist theology stems from um, some of the foremothers of the black church. So you have Jarena Lee, who's one of the first black woman preachers. Um, you have Rebecca Jackson, who was one of the first black shakers. And you have these writings from black women speaking about their experiences in the black church and being silenced, essentially. Um, and that's a similar. It's, it's by by black preachers, by like by, men, by, right? by, by men. So, yeah. Yeah. So it's I mean, the LDS church and a lot of black churches have a lot of similar similarities in that sense where women aren't allowed to or are not able to. Called ecclesiastical office yes. and that sort of thing, yeah. Exactly. And so that's where you have this emergence of black women preachers and theologians saying, hey, this is these patriarchal, this patriarchal theology is not really speaking to my experience. This is not talking about class. This is it's talking about race somewhat, um, but it's not talking about gender, about sexuality, about um, all the different intersections. And so this is where you have the Jacqueline Grants, the Dolores S. Williams coming up. And um, actually, Dolores S. Williams is the first. Uh, she coined the term womanist theology in 1987. And so they started this dialogue in the 80s, which is the 70s and 80s was this renaissance period for black women's voices. You have Alice Walker, Toni Morrison, Polly Marshall um, talking about spirituality and um, Alice Walker's the one, one person who coined the term womanism. But it's this they were I say regaining. They were speaking about their own personal experiences and some of it was supernatural. Some of it was just stemming from their own faith. And so that that really that transferred into theology. I, I guess you could say, based on their experiences and their own spirituality, they then turned to the practice of theology, which is a little bit more formal, involves writing, involves interacting in dialogue with other people. Is that kind of how it, it took shape then through the 80s and 90s is sort of this community of theologians that began to produce work more formally than before? Yes. Yeah, so, um, so with womanist theology, it's based in womanist ethics. And so those womanist ethics, there's a book called, um, well, Black Womanist Ethics by Emily Towns. And she uses the work of Zora Neale Hurston as a framework for womanist theology. And so essentially, when you're looking at womanist theology, you're looking at black women's writings. Um, you're looking at, like I had mentioned a couple authors before. Um, so in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, you have these this renaissance of black women writing, and they're talking about their spirituality. They're talking about oppression. They're not even they're not just talking about oppression. They're talking about how they've been able to survive and thrive through these different things. And that's really where womanist theology stems from. Is not only from the Jarena Lees and the uh, Rebecca Jacksons, but also like the 70s and 80s authors. How would you contrast it with feminist theology? So there's feminist theology, there's womanist theology. So if you look at Alice Walker's original definition of womanism, she says that womanism is to feminism as purple as is to lavender. And I think that's a perfect descriptor of feminism. I think feminist theology has done a lot of work, especially in dealing in terms with sexism, sexuality within theology. But I'd say the difference is that womanist theology is centered on black women's experiences. The original term of womanism, Alice Walker describes that a womanist is a as a feminist of color. Um, so it is possible for women of color to be womanists, but it's the theory, the framework has been constructed by black women. And so that's more of the difference between so you have black feminism, you have black feminist theology, but People like myself tend to shift more towards womanism just because of the negative connotations with with feminism. I I agree with a lot of feminist ideals, but just the history of third wave feminism, some of the stuff you see today with feminism, just commercialization of it, makes me lean more towards wom womanism and womanist theology. So, are you saying feminism can almost be a label that people can just adopt without 
doing much lifting or anything like that. And womanism maybe for you and your project is more engaged and se- as a label seems to fit your work better than, than what feminism would fit. Is that? Yeah, it, it fits my work a little bit more. Um, I, there are a lot of, especially Mormon feminists who are doing the, the heavy lifting and they're doing fantastic job. But for me, especially with this stage where I am with my work, working with black women's voices and, and being able to center those voices. Um, that's the only critique I really have of feminism is that it's centered around whiteness and womanism is not. Do you think it's because of, mostly because of the practitioners of feminism as much uh, like f- they're attending to the things that directly concern them? And if, if you're white, then usually, you know, you kind of see the world through those lens. You, you put yourself as the default of of the world sort of a thing and so their work will reflect that perspective and then black women uh, will see that and say well it doesn't really fit with what we're seeing like that's through your eyes here's something that we're seeing through our eyes is that yeah it gives so i I feel like womanism gives black women another opportunity to not only engage each other but themselves and what faith and spirituality mean to them um you do have intersectional feminism you have I guess you, I, I'm not going to, pretty close to lots, lots of feminists who are doing a lot of great work. And that's something that's really going to be very near and dear to me. But I know just womanism is just, I just could talk about it all day. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's really interesting yeah. because some of these boundary wars are for an outsider who's not really involved in it. It can be disorienting or it can be confusing. But from, from what I am picking up from what you're saying, you, you're sort of trying to be fair to these different types of practices and, and seeing you know good things in a lot of different approaches. But the one that really resonates with you that you're pursuing is womanist theology. So you're yes. seeing other work going on around you and, and people are welcome to their tasks. But for whatever reason, you feel called to this part of the garden. This is kind of where you're cultivating. It is. I, that's actually a great metaphor for I'm cultivating my garden in the womanist field, I guess. Yeah, yeah that's 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 essentially what I've been doing and, and getting to listen to black women's stories. That's something that's been very important to me. And I, I mentioned before family gatherings and talking about family history and just what did people do to survive and to thrive and to be able to read those stories and read, especially as a, a Latter-day Saint, reading Jane Manning James's autobiography and how she stayed in the church despite all of these things that were thrown her way, all these challenges and all she these... She was an early black Latter-day she, Saint who was denied temple ordinances, but who kept appealing for them and yeah. She did, yes. And so that, I mean, her story is a perfect example of black women in America that we've often been denied many things but we know we've been able to cultivate a sense of hope within our own community and to cultivate a sense or cultivate joy and that's what womanism is for me is not only looking at the justice seeking christ as a a black person understand like black theology but also what does joy look like in, in my space. One thing that just reminded me of was Terrell Givens and Fiona Givens wrote um, The Crucible of Doubt. There's a chapter in there that talks about seeking wisdom and goodness at a lot of different wells, like a well of water kind of a thing. And it sounds to me like while you're a Latter-day Saint, you also are drawn to a lot of different wells from which you draw water to sort of to be spiritually nourished that are from outside the LDS tradition. Is that is that fair to say? It is. So I, I draw a lot of inspiration from the black church. That's something that I grew up with. Um, I, I draw a lot of inspiration from womanist theology from my own, from my own family. Um, some, like, I love family history. I, I can talk about family history all day. <laughs> and I've been doing a lot of genealogy work and just coming across the folklore and the traditions that people in my family would, would do. Like, so, for example, my mom always used to wear this coin around her ankle. And I was like, what is, what is going on with this coin? And so I did some more research on it, and I found a slave narrative from my great-great-great-grandmother talking about how this coin was used to for protection. And so people might look at that as like, well, that's witchcraft. like that's. But no, this is how when you living, when you were enslaved and you were, you know, after um, Reconstruction, like you couldn't just go to walk into any hospital. A lot of people had to come up with their own solutions, a lot of, and that's what we call folklore or traditional folk medicine, like people had, these are things that people had to do. And in a lot of ways, I've incorporated those beliefs into my Mormonism, because we are speaking about identity, like that's a part of my identity. It's not just Janan, the the Latter-day Saint, I'm I'm a black woman, 
I am a Latter-day Saint, I'm a daughter, I'm all of these different things in that part of that part of that womanist stories, theology narrative is incorporated into that. It sort of reminds me, I mean, this is, I don't know why it does, but it reminds me a little bit of like Joseph Smith and the Seer Stones. I mean, this is today, Latter-day Saints look at that as such a strange practice. It might be called folk magic or sort of different, but for him, it, it also ended up holding some religious significance. And so, which he then integrated as part of his religious experience. And so to hear you talk about being connected to this history of slavery and, to, and your mother having this coin and, and, and it having these, not just, uh, not just as a, something to remember uh, the past by, but as something that carries its own value in some way. Uh, that's really interesting, um, and I and I, I agree. I'm, I, I like that you pointed out. It's this isn't some kind of like witchcraft, like something to look askance at, but a way to integrate your family history in into your religious faith in a way that that brings them together. Are you the only Latter Day Saint in your family? Yes, I am. How do they feel about that? Uh, I mean, now you're a Latter-day Saint, but you're also seeking higher education in theology. What, 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 what do they think about that? What am I doing with my life? Yes. Um, they were a little bit hesitant at first, especially my, my mom's side, um, just because of that background, the Methodist mm -hmm. background. But they've seen the changes that, it, that I've made in my life and the way that I've been able to incorporate family traditions into my Mormonism has made it a lot easier the transition has been it's been a lot easier so yeah, it's not like you had to draw this line in the sand and, and and sort of cut yourself off this is that's interesting this is a way that you've and and they've become kind of more i mean i guess they had to get used to it right because like you're still here so <laughs> yeah you know I, I mean they had to get used to my husband so you know it just kind of came, came with the package so <laughs> that's cool how about the academic side of things um have you felt and not just for your family but how about in the religious community because it's it's kind of unusual for any latter-day saint to pursue higher education in theology um i've really enjoyed the experience that was something when i was at howard university that was it was it was an experience, I'll say, because I was the only Mormon, only black Mormon mm -hmm. um, there. And so there's a lot of curiosity behind that. But it was a great learning experience to be able to engage these other Christian faith traditions within the LDS community. I, I haven't had a lot of issues, a lot of or a lot of pushback. It's a lot of I've gotten a lot of questions, mm -hmm. yeah. especially with womanist theology. Because I mean, talking about black liberation theology or womanist theology is like, what what is this like? What, you know, yeah, what how, does, this? Yeah. how does this, how does this apply to, is this Mormon? What is this Christian? And it's, it is, this is what black people, we haven't necessarily used the terms black liberation theology or womanist theology, but what black people did during slavery, after slavery, and now could be, it created the framework for, for those different theologies. And so do you see it as an avenue for especially for black Latter-day Saints as they become more familiar with church history as they kind of learn some of the more difficult things about the past is is black theology could that become more of a resource within the church I think for black Latter-day Saints to engage and confront the history of the LDS church and perhaps engage in better ways with the tradition uh, instead of maybe feeling alienation or some of the pain that comes along with learning about that history yeah, so I I would love to see it integrated more into the mainstream theology, especially for Black saints. There are aspects of Black liberation theology and womanist theology that are difficult to navigate or to interconnect with Mormonism, mm -hmm. um, especially with the idea of the cross mm -hmm. um, culturally. You know, the cross is yeah, not really a, yeah, it's less emphasized in Mormonism. Yeah, yeah, and and for for not all I say hashtag not all black people yeah. um, <laughs> um, that the cross has a very special meaning and it's not just recognizing his death on the cross but also his resurrection mm -hmm. and that if you we, for thinking about cone he, he talks about Christ overcoming death and for black people that's something that really resonates it's a powerful symbol it's a very powerful symbol and so taking that aspect of black liberation theology and trying to include it in mormonism is very difficult and mm -hmm. so as much as i would love to to see the integration or not even integration because integration is just a tricky word because mm -hmm. we look at integration now and it's like you lose focus of what was originally being integrated if that makes any sense um it kind of blurs all it down. blurs it's, it's like a it's color blur instead of it is yeah instead of a celebration or a collaboration absolutely so yeah 
this is where I think it might be difficult for any religious organization that sort of puts together teaching materials or anything like this is to to be able to integrate, to use that problematic word again, a lot of different perspectives. And, and so I think Latter-day Saints have been pretty averse to imagery of the cross, for example, but it can hold a different meaning for people with with a black background or with coming from different traditions or coming with a different understanding of what the cross can mean. And I think it would be pretty neat to, to see people have the opportunity to share that in a church lesson or in a, in a sacrament meeting talk or something like that, where they can say, you know, I, I recognize, you know, this is how we Mormons usually talk about the cross. Here's something else. Here's something else to consider. Here's what it means to me. It's almost a form of, of testimony bearing in a way because testimonies are personal. So do you see any avenues for talking about different theological ideas in that way then that, that maybe aren't going to come up in formal lesson plans? But do you have opportunities to talk about that, to, to talk about some of these different perspectives in church or anything like that? Yes, I have. So I am a Relief Society teacher in my ward. And actually during the month of February, I got to do a lesson on Black Mormons mm. and to kind of discuss the history, mm -hmm. um, a little bit of the theology. The response was... It was good, lots of shock mm -hmm. <laughs> on a lot of the things. Uh, I think there's a way to have these discussions that is a faith promoting, but also a truth telling. Mm -hmm. That's a big thing about womanist theology and, and black liberation theology is the truth telling. And sometimes people don't wanna hear the truth. And so I hope, and I and I think there's a way to integrate it into, into to lessons. Um, it just is a lot of contemplation and a lot of just understanding what is being said and not necessarily diluting the message, but making it clear as far as what you're centering on. We're talking today with Janan Graham Russell. She's a writer and graduate of the Howard University School of Divinity, and her research focuses on womanist theology and Mormonism and also identity formation in racial communities. And her work's been featured in two books, Mormon Feminism, Essential Writings, and also a book called A Book of Mormons. She's also written for The Atlantic, and she's going to continue her research this fall in the PhD program uh, in the Study of Religion Department at Harvard University. And she's here joining us at the Maxwell Institute this week for discussions on race, identity, and theology. So, Janan, I wanted to ask you about a recent conference for Mormon scholars that you attended and you spoke at. You discussed how the LDS Church has had a complex relationship, especially with members of black African descent in history, policies, and culture. And here's a quote from that presentation you gave that I wanted you to talk about. You said, the presence of black women in the LDS Church is distinct and has been marked by both invisibility and hypervisibility. Invisibility and hypervisibility. Will you expand on that, what you meant by that? So when I talk about hypervisibility and invisibility in terms of black women, when you think about the priesthood and temple restrictions, I mean, when you, they're originally, they're usually called a priesthood ban. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at the original comments made by Brigham Young and, and subsequent prophets and church leaders, that it, it re continually refers to men and those who are in proximity to men. And so even though black women weren't named in these restrictions, they were affected. I don't say just to the priesthood, but just access to the temple. They're and so invisible they're that, invisible. In yeah. That in that discourse. sense. And yeah. so that's the invisible invisibility aspect. But when you look at uh, the hyper visibility aspect of, of, of black women's existence within the church, I think of, I was just in the um, special collections today, looking at just different records, which I was very grateful for. <laughs> um, Shout out to the special collections at BYU. <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> shout out to you guys. Um, thanks for your patience. Um, <laughs> just looking at, I was going through records and lots of folklore and jokes about their quote unquote Negro jokes. Yeah. and. In thinking in terms of hyper visibility is that people really in the church's history and sometimes often in the present that people don't really see black people they see caricatures or stereotypes and that's a that hyper visibility part is where we might be the only black person in our ward and you'll get the questions like how did you do your hair like that or can I touch your hair or you know, do you burn this? Just, just you questions. Sunburns. You, yeah, sunburns. Just questions like that. And so that's, you know, you really, you tend to stick out and when you don't really want to stick out. And so that's, that's the, 
that's the kind of they're hyper visible in that very way. Very hyper visible, and especially um, in in more you know, Mormon feminism, more a- activist um, movements that you might be the only black person or woman of color in these events or these actions rather. And it is it's it can be a, it's a very it's it can be a hard place to be. Mm-hmm. I'd also like to ask you to read an extended quotation from that presentation I have um, so we can unpack that a little bit more. It's this paragraph right here. Because of the church's history with people of black African descent, black women have had to find new ways of understanding God in themselves that resist prevailing ideas of what it means to be a woman, what it means to be Mormon, and what it means to be black. These ideas often ignore the intersection of race and gender and do not provide a system of thinking to better understand the place of a black woman in society or God's kingdom. Mormon womanism is a developing theory where black LDS women can fill these gaps in understanding by finding their relationship with the divine. Okay, so we've talked about liberation theology, black theology, womanist theology, and now you're drilling down even further to Mormon womanist theology. In context of that quote, talk about that a little bit more about what your project is like. Something that I've often heard in Sunday school or just within conversations is that why can't you just be Mormon? Why can't you just be LDS? What is, why do you have to be black and LDS, black and Mormon? And the thing about that is that my blackness informs my Mormonism and my Mormonism informs my blackness more so the first (laughs) than the Mm. the second. And so when I'm, I'm thinking about this quote and talking about what it means to be Mormon and what it means to be black, when I'm looking at, or I'm creating this framework for Mormon womanism, I'm thinking in terms of what does it mean to be a black woman in the LDS church? There's a lot that we can learn in LDS theology and culture that can be beneficial for black people and black women, but specifically in terms of race and gender. With Mormon womanism, my intent is to create a dialogue in which black women can engage their own personal experiences amongst each other and within themselves. And so I think sometimes within LDS culture and theology, as I have mentioned before, it's very white, Americentric, Euro- Eurocentric, and a Mormon womanism provides an opportunity for black women to explore life on their own terms, whether it's dealing with oppression, dealing with sexism or racism or classism or the different isms um, that exist. So within within Mormon womanism, within this project, what are some interesting questions that, that are going to come up and, and they're going to be explored as you embark on this project? And, and I assume that uh, you're hopefully going to be joined by a lot of people that can be engaging in these questions as well. But what type of things are going to come up? What, what type of questions are we going to see being raised within this theological approach? Yes. Oh, I hope people do join the conversation. Um, One of the, I would say, one of the basic questions I believe in Mormon womanism is, is, is to ask how these texts engage blackness and dark skin, especially as a black Mormon, a black Latter-day Saint. That is a, it's a a pertinent question. It's, it's part of your being a Latter-day Saint is this hovering idea of what it means of this overarching idea of what blackness has meant in the LDS church since the mid 1800s or early 1800s rather. So that's one question. Another question that Mormon womanism asks is how does the text treat women? So we look at perfect example uh, is in, in the old Testament. We look at Abraham and Sarah and the story of Hagar. And there's a tendency to look at Abraham as the oppressor, but through a womanist lens, you look at Abraham and Sarah as oppressive. And this is not like hashtag all white women are, you know, (laughs) are are oppressive, but it, Mormon womanism looks at, it's an intersectional look at our theology, Mormon theology. So you're going to be examining scriptural texts, histories, and this sort of thing. You mentioned looking at, uh, uh, are you looking at oral histories? Are you doing any projects pertaining to more contemporary sources at all? Yeah, so my big project, I'm sure it'll, it'll evolve over the next five to seven years, is to look at healing traditions, womanist healing traditions within Mormonism and doing a comparative study between the United States and Haiti or Cuba, um, some part of the Caribbean, um, and look at how folk traditions, healing traditions cross over into Mormonism. Do they do 
black Mormon women retain those healing traditions or do they take on more traditional prescribed uh, beliefs about the culture? So going back to the idea of quote unquote witchcraft or folk folklore or like the coin I was speaking about before, it's like, do those traditions that people have in their families for generations, do they keep them or do they discard them when they become Mormon? And so it's, it's a bit of a ethnographic post-colonial project um be doing some uh, definitely doing oral histories but that's i mean it's a part of more more in womanism is to look at the stories of black women and and to be able to tell those stories and tell the truth about ourselves that's something that i don't believe not in, even if we look at the autobiography of jane manning james it was written by a, a white woman um we do have the you know biographies from um, Sisters in Zion, you have Wynetta Martin and and among others. But when you hear about black people, especially black women, it's, it's usually, it's either not there or it's told by white men or white scholars. Mm -hmm. And this is not, I'm not against that work, but I also think it's very necessary for black people and black women, especially in the church, to be able to talk about ourselves just because our narratives have always been like outside mm -hmm. looking in. Well, I mean, even this interview is being driven by uh, a white guy. Yeah, what's yeah, going on, Blair? Yeah. Like, I just, <laughs> Sorry. You no. Know, That's all I can do. Yeah, I appreciate it. Well, I really look forward to seeing what you come up with as you pursue uh, your degree at Harvard and as you continue this project. Um, before we go, I wanted to also mention um, something I saw in in in, a, in the book Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison, mm. which seems to me to be a, kind of an extended meditation on identities. We started off this conversation talking about identity, so I thought we could kind of close on that. And in the book, he wrote this quote, when I discover who I am, I'll be free. Uh, as, as we wind the conversation down, I just wanted to hear your reflections on identity and discovering who you are and freedom. So there's, there's the act of nomo in West African cultural belief systems where it's the act of self-naming. And for black people, for African Americans, depending on how you want to identify yourself, is that that naming has always come from outside sources. We always knew who we were. Black people knew that we weren't cursed, but that was something that others imposed on black people. And so when we're able to tell our own stories, when we're able to highlight those narratives, that's when that's when we are truly free and i love that quote from ralph ellison he invisible man is a is an incredible book but i think as black mormons and it's just there's a lot of black mormons who are telling their own stories and as, as that happens as more black mormons tell their own stories our culture is there our histories are there and our narratives are there and it's just waiting for black mormons to to put it out there we're the work is there we're we're doing the work it's just having a platform to be able to speak on our own terms um there's sometimes a tendency to whitewash because it, it's not quote-unquote faith promoting but there's not the story of african americans the story of black people is not always going to be faith promoting and it's being able to have to sit down and have honest conversations about the theology of of blackness within the church and what black people in the church are doing to push back against those narratives. Yeah, that's kind of that Karl Barth idea of theology being a self-test, uh, being a way to kind of look at our tradition and, and, and the way that we've, uh, the way that race has played such a role within the tradition. There's a lot of work to, to be done. There is, there is. And it's, it's important to let black people do the work and there's, you know, white people need to do their own work in their own spaces, but also, you know, listening to to black people that's always it's always appreciated yeah that's a good start yeah <laughs> well good well thank you so much janan this has been uh, a great conversation that's uh, janan graham russell she's a writer and graduate of the howard university school of divinity she joined us here today at the maxwell institute and she's preparing for a phd program at harvard in the study of religion department there thank you so much for being here janan thank you for having me it's been a pleasure